like two chapters, but it's so like relevant because it talks about the broken house. Does anybody remember Haggai? Two, two chapters? You should read Haggai, but there was a there's a part in Haggai that I was drawn to this morning. Just two verses. Joshua, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord, their God, and the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent them. And this is where I was really drawn to. And the people showed reverence for the Lord. And, and I think that's one thing, like when things are going like pretty chaotic and haywire, if we can actually center ourselves and show reverence to the Lord, you see that things actually slow down, right? Like things will just slow down if in the moment you can just say, Lord, where am I in this and where are you in this? Then Haggai, the messenger of the Lord, spoke by the commission of the Lord to the people saying, I am with you, declares the Lord. And I love this idea that he wasn't just with him then and now he's with them. It's actually when we showed reverence that we recognized that God was with us. It wasn't up before God wasn't with me and now God is with me. It was when I'm able to center myself and show the proper respect and awe for who he is, I recognize he's with me. And he was with me and he will be with me but in the right now Then I can march out and do anything I need to do in that respect. So stand with me because I actually want to center ourselves in reverence so that we can push forward in excitement and faith. Father, we worship you. We honor you. We center ourselves in the understanding. the one who just envelops all in all. You are glory and you are light and you are, you are everything. And if you withdrew from us, we understand that every breath of our body would disappear. Father, I surrender to you and I reverently bow all my will and my desire and all my thoughts and my opinions and everything that I have that makes me see you in a lesser way than I have the opportunity to see Jesus, you, the crown jewel of heaven, we show reverence and respect. We bow at your feet. We understand that we sit at your right hand, but we know who you are. So, Father, I can actually joyously say, I fear you. I fear you. love you. Walking 
my soul. You are in every moment. You are the greatest miracle. So why should my heart grow weary? Don't be so downcast, oh my soul. You are in every moment. You are the greatest miracle.
forget the wonders of how you brought deliverance the exodus of my heart so you found me you freed me held back the waters for my relief oh Yahweh cause you're the God who fights for me Lord of every Hallelujah, hallelujah, and you have torn apart the sea, you have led me through the deep, hallelujah, hallelujah, a cloud by day, a sign that you are with me, a fire by night. The guiding light to my feet You found me, you found me You freed me and held back the waters from my release Here we go! Oh Yahweh You're the God who fights for me Lord of every victory Hallelujah Hallelujah have torn apart the sea you have led me through the deep hallelujah hallelujah Again. you're the god who fights for me lord of every victory hallelujah hallelujah and you have torn apart the sea you have led me through the deep, hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, is there joy in the house today? Let's sing it out. You stepped in. You stepped into my Egypt And you took me by the hand And you marched me out in freedom And into the promised land And now I will not forget you, God I'll sing of all you've done Death is swallowed up forever Let's do it again! You stepped in! You stepped into my Egypt and you took me by the hand And you marched me out in freedom And into the promised land And now I will not forget you, God I'll sing of all you've done Death is swallowed up forever By the glory of your love You're the God who fights for me Lord of have led me through the deep hallelujah hallelujah you're the god Cause you're the god who fights for me lord of every victory hallelujah hallelujah you have torn apart the sea you have led me through the deep hallelujah 
brought you to my Egypt, and you took me by the hand, and you marched me out of freedom and into the promised land. Now I will not forget you, God. I'll sing of all you've done. Death is swallowed up forever. And if you One more time. Your words, you stepped into my Egypt. And you took me by the hand And you marched me out in freedom And into the promised land Now I will not forget you, God I'll sing of all you've done Death is swallowed up forever By the fury of your love You're the God who fights for me Lord of everything torn apart the sea you have led me through the deep hallelujah one more time hallelujah you're the God who fights for me Lord of every victory hallelujah hallelujah you have torn that fights for us. Like Ben preached last week, we so think God is on one side or the other, but God is for the nation. And that is a perspective that is raised up. And I think in such a time as this, the church should be interceding on behalf of the nation it finds itself in, seeking the peace of the city, for in it is our peace. Seeking the welfare of that nation, for in it is our welfare. This is Jeremiah. This is the prophets of old saying these things. These are the ancient paths. And so God, we pray as if we are the nation today. Because we are. And we thank you, Lord, that you dwell richly in and among us. God and man together forevermore. And we trust that you are with us in this nation, working, establishing truth, establishing the righteousness and the kingdom of God in our nation, just as it is in heaven. We trust you, God. I just 
I'm going to ask that every one of us that can hear my voice, would you just like turn your heart as if you were the nation, not on a political side, not a specific like financial, like this is what I have at stake or anything else, but we simply turn as the nation of the United States and we turn our heart to the Lord and we corporately ask for the mercy of God to come. God, we admit that we don't see the whole picture as individuals, but corporately we come as a nation, we come as a people, we come as sons and daughters, of citizens of heaven. And we ask that you would have your way in our nation. Despite the plans of men, may the wisdom of God yes. prevail in the United States. In Jesus' name, we declare your kingdom, your will, your glory would be established forevermore. God, what were you originally thinking about? When this nation was being birthed, let it be established. 2021, 250, almost 50 years later, Lord God, let that seed bring forth a harvest in this hour. And Father, I pray that we would be stewards of this harvest. Good stewards not partisan stewards, good stewards of the seed which you sowed hundreds of years ago. This is our time. This is our place. And we will steward this harvest well. Father, we declare our trust in you. May that make us trustworthy of this harvest. Are you guys with me? Yes. I just want to make sure I'm not alone in this prayer. Lift our eyes, God. Lift our eyes off of news. Lift our eyes off of opinion. Lift our eyes off of my truth. And we set our eyes on the way, the truth, and the life. We set our eyes on the King of Kings. We exalt the King over any president in our country over any Congress, over any elected official. We exalt you, Jesus, and we ask that you release wisdom, you release insight, you release knowledge and power into those who have been elected into places of service. Have your way, O oh God. brought us this far, God. We trust you for the rest. We trust you for the rest. Come on, we trust you. Can we just declare that together? We trust in God. We trust you, Jesus. Faithful to finish what you started. Yes. Come on, pray. 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 Intercede. This is the house of prayer for all nations, including our own. Two 
over this nation, oh God. Let your faith go before us and beside and behind us all around us. Your family over the and your families and the children and the families and the children. upon you in a thousand generations and your family and your children and the children sing that again sing it over the nation may his favor be upon you in a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children and his presence go before you and behind you and beside where there has been so much cursing so much negativity so much shouting of one side or the other God we speak blessing that heals blessing that binds blessing that seals the promises of God to a nation we bless you United States we bless you America we bless you with light we bless you with love. We bless you with favor. We know who you are. We know who you are. Rise up. Rise up. Every promise of God concerning you shall be fulfilled in Jesus' name.
can't even hear if I'm on key. I'm okay. All right, let's try that again. Amos 5.24. Open up your Bibles if you need to. Can you hear us, sir? Are you listening? The sons and the daughters are here. All of creation, we have heard you cry. We are here to answer your prayer. Let's do that again. Can you hear us, sir? Are you listening? The sons and the daughters are here. All of creation, we have heard you cry. We are here to answer your prayer.
opportunity to be encouragement, the opportunity to be resource, the opportunity, all these things that fill people's needs. Father, I pray that we settle that in our hearts soberly. We recognize the great gift that you are and the great gift that we are to this earth. offering baskets. So I just want to thank you. A lot of people are actually giving online, so I want to thank you for that. But if you have offering right now, um, we thank you and we bless you for that. The offering baskets are here. It's blessed because you're blessed. See you all. Love you very much. Uh, to the men, uh, if you haven't seen uh, on the projection that on January 29th, we have our first men's night for the year. Very excited about rekindling this fire uh, that we have inside of us and spending some time with you guys. Um, you can see it's be 6 to 8 30. is kind of flexible. We usually extend beyond that, but I will honor your time. You can leave at any point you want. We will have some food there. Um, so come hungry if you need to. Um, we're just going to get into who we are and just really kind of create a plan for us this year. Um, and I'm excited to be with you guys. So please uh, get the word out. Uh, I think you can go to our website and under the calendar and look for the men's night display that you see here. If you go to RSVP, that'd be great. That helps us out with planning. Uh, if you're not, just, just see me and let me know. Love you guys. All right. I think we can dismiss the kids now, right? Who they found? Jocelyn? So today it's going to look a little different. I think this is going to be fun. We don't get to hear just from one person. That's cool. But today, well, we get to hear from Mark. You hear from Mark a lot, so you could, you could be happy about that. But we also get to hear from Wayne. So can we say hello to Wayne as we welcome him up here? No, no, you can really do it. Like I wasn't, like I wasn't metaphorical. Like I was like, And this month we're talking about relational, relationships and relational discourse. So we're not bringing them up because they have relational discourse. We're bringing them up to help us see the way through those type of events in our life. So we thank you and we honor you and thank you. Hello, everyone. It's good to be here this morning and be with you and... Mark asked me to participate in this, so I'm looking at him to be the leader of this and do uh, some of the talking. So, uh, Mark, I'm going to let you take it from here. Oh, you're going to let me? Yep. Okay. I give you permission. All right. If you know this guy, you know it's hard to get him to stop talking. <clears throat> and it's the reason why we don't have our wives up here. We definitely can't get them to stop talking. So... Um. <laughs> Uh, we did, uh, because of the, the shortness of time that we know we're trying to uh, adhere to, we thought it would be good for just the two of us, though. Ruth, I want you to know at any point in time, if you wish, like if there's something burning on the inside of you, please feel free to bring it up. Mrs., same with you, okay? Oh, you look very happy over there. I don't think you're coming anywhere near this microphone. Okay, so yeah, relational discourse. Um, 
The reason why we feel like this is really important is all you have to do is open up your phone or your computer right now. And I think you'll recognize that this is a needed discussion to keep having. Um, I was thinking about the Bible study that we just had this week with Leslie, and Leslie was so careful and intentional to share with us that even in the midst of every one of our discussions, whether very personal and close or whether kind of disconnected like through electronics or something like that, the question should be consistently asked, are we centering ourselves in who Jesus is? Is Jesus our center? Is Jesus the source of the thoughts and the words that are coming forth from our mouth? And I'm not really good at this yet, but I try to be as intentional as possible, is that as the words are coming out of my mouth, oftentimes re typing them on a computer or in my phone, I actually see them like going past the scrutiny of the Lord. Like I feel like it's okay for us to do that. In fact, I think it would be really healthy if we kind of practice that. Like as the thought, as the word is leaving us, or even as we're thinking about it, it's kind of like passing through the view of God. And to actually pause and allow God to have his opinion about that thought. Have you ever done that? Like 10% of the time, 5% of the time. <laughs> Sometimes we're frustration. We're just like, God, we don't have time for your opinion. This has got to get out. But if ask for forgiveness later. Yeah, right. So we're hoping that we can help facilitate a better discussion that leads to better relationships. Because Jesus did talk about how this is how the world will know that he is Lord. Yeah. Right? Uh -huh. That's right. Yeah. Thank you. Just keep doing that. That's really healthy. Do you want to say anything to that before I keep going? Well, I, I, I just want to really affirm what Mark preached two weeks ago, Ben preached last Sunday, and Leslie, kind of the, that theme of Christ, God, the Father being center. That is so, so important and so valuable. And I think the reason it is because as Mark's talking about what happens on social media and what happens in other places that people are speaking is... I become the center, and my thoughts become the center. And somehow we want to include all the Father into my thoughts rather than know his thoughts, and how can I become a part of that? I think that is so, so critical with where we are. So as Wayne and I were talking about what we would do today, um, I want to kind of launch off of James 1.19 again. So if you guys want to turn there, uh, it was from two weeks ago. This was a verse that really stuck out to me. And what I want to do is, I didn't do this two weeks ago when I shared about this, but I want to do the context of this verse today just a little bit and maybe have us kind of have a discussion around this and beyond. But. Right. In verse 17, actually verse 16, do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. For me, verse 17 speaks to this confirmation of sourcing ourselves in the Lord. And I love those words. There is no variation, neither shadow by turning. In other words, Jesus is himself. That word, remember the verse that says Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever? If you look in the original language, it actually means Jesus is himself. He does not violate his nature depending upon history. He doesn't change his perspective. He doesn't change his intent or his purpose based upon what's going on in our lives or in the earth. There is no variation, neither shadow cast by turning. Yep. In, ex in the exercise of his will, verse 18, he brought us forth by the word of truth. This is how we were brought forth. We were brought into existence by the word of truth. 
That word is the logos, which is Jesus. So we are sourced. Our very existence is sourced in the word of truth. Let our continued existence be the same. Amen? This is what he's saying. He's saying, this is where you came from. Continue in it. So that we would be a kind of first fruits among his creatures. I think, Mark, that is so important that we understand that today. That we would be, the uh, Passion Translation uses the word, the favorite one in creation. And I think what we want to understand is we have a voice. We have uh, a connection with Abba Father. And to understand and know that when we are connected at that level, we are a different representation than what the world is accustomed to today. We are coming to them or we are speaking from a perspective of truth that's deep within us because of who we are in him. And that truth is in us. And as we present that, as we project that, not just in our words, but in our actions and our reactions, when we are presenting that truth, we're a different, we're, we're right side up in an upside down world. And I think it's so important that we understand that, that we have a truth to present and to project and to speak and to act from that is going to make a difference in the world that we live in. And I think that's the truth that he's talking about here. We are his favorite one, chosen one in this creation in the world we live in today. That's so critical. When I see what's happening around us, and it, it's kind of interesting that we're sitting like this, it's because whenever I have my thoughts and my th- ideas and my opinions and I'm going to sh- I'm going to project them onto you and you better hear it because I have the truth and you better hear it and if you don't I'm going to make sure you do and now I'm in trouble because I'm not projecting truth to you from his perspective I'm projecting truth to you from my perspective and I'm going to force you or demand you or I'll do whatever I need to do to make sure you understand my truth. I'm not the favorite one at that point. I have joined in the rhetoric. I've enj- I have joined in whatever. And I think I'm speaking truth in the rhetoric, and I'm just speaking rhetoric again and again and again wow. and again. And the truth, when I'm connected to the, the truth, and that's projected for me, I come to you as a brother, and I interact with you as a brother speaking truth to you. And no longer, no longer does that become a dividing wall to us. That actually becomes something we begin to glean from one another and share heart to heart with. Yeah, like if I, I, I can tell when you're responding to the rhetoric versus the spirit because it starts to feel like a demand. Yep. Your truth starts to feel like a demand on me. And when yep, I feel right. demanded upon, I immediately begin to become defensive about my perspective and my way. Yep. And before long, there becomes this like almost like a battle of truth back and forth right. that's taking place. But if we are truly these favored ones, these first fruits, yep. Like, I feel like that's the great perspective then of verse 19. Can, can we move on that's to that? Or correct. do you want to say some more? Right. You okay on that? Yep. Well, just the, the fact yeah. that what you said, you feel demanded. When yeah. I come at you feel demanded. When, when the demand world is in place, when the demand is in place, it takes away your freedom to respond to me from your heart. Mm-hmm. The demand world takes away the freedom to respond back mm-hmm. from your heart. Yeah, I'll just, I'm going to pause. I do want to get to 19 but, um, because I think it's important. But in that moment, I feel like that demand thing, how many people have heard this term, cancel culture? Okay. I had to look that up because I'd heard about it a lot, but I wasn't exactly sure what it meant, so I looked it up. Has anybody ever looked it up to know what it means? Okay, so a few of you have. 
So the reality is, I thought it just necessarily meant, like, if you say something I don't agree with, I just voice my opinion that differs from you so much that it literally shuts you down. Mm -hmm. But it's worse than that. That's right. Like, cancel culture is writing you as a person off completely and making sure that the rest of my world, whoever knows me, knows that you are of no longer value to listen to or of importance. That's what actually the term means. Right. And uh, I was reading about it in like some of the, like I read a couple articles about it in the last couple of days just to kind of get perspective on it in the world. And there's actually already now a growing uh, rise of the antagonist or the, or the, you know, against that, which is, no, 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 no. We, we, we. So I'm really glad to see that there's already this rise coming up of, hey, hey, you know, just because one person's opinion differs from yours doesn't mean that they're completely written off. But I will tell you, there's still this huge rise of if you and I disagree, we completely write one another off. Right. And in that moment, I promise you, we have no longer sourced ourselves in the Father's perspective of one another. I mean, that for me is a huge key. If I, when I think about you, for example, and I think about the thing I disagree with you on, I've just written off the rest of you. And what we've done is we've isolated our relationships to this one point where we disagree versus the wholeness of who you are and who I am. Yeah, yeah we, we get to a point where it's no longer that we're different. It's one of us has got to be right. If, in other words, if I'm right and you're different, you've now, therefore, you are wrong. And here's what I used to say. You know, Mark... I'll just let you be wrong. And it's like God took me to the woodshed on that and said, you're still seeing Mark is wrong. And that's not me. It's we just think different. It's not that I'm right and you're wrong. This even happens at home once in a while. Uh, just once in a while. <laughs> a few times over the years where... She's been right, and therefore I was wrong. You notice how I said that? I said that <laughs> the other way around. It doesn't like I was right, she's wrong. She's right, and I'm wrong. No, it's just that we have differences of opinions. And because we're different doesn't mean we're right or wrong. Now, there's some things that are just black and white from Scripture that are not truth. But I don't think that's what we're talking about most of the time. We're talking about ideologies or what our belief system is. Yeah, what I'd like to see us do in this relational discourse discussion is stop deciding our relational connection on issues. Right, right. And get back to determining relational connection on who we are. Yes, yeah. For some reason, we got off course and we no longer think of that's Nick, that's Brian, that's Lauren. We now say, that's a person who believes this, that's a person who thinks this, that's a person who said that. Yeah. And we've gotten off track from the perspective of heaven, which is, that's my beloved daughter, and these are my beloved sons. Yeah. And when we start to see one another that way, there's a more holistic approach to our relationships. There's an elevated perspective I believe we have. Do I think that there are things that are more right? Are there issues that need to be dealt with? Absolutely. But the best way for them to be dealt with is to decide that the person I'm wrestling those issues with is my friend, is my brother or my sister. Correct. That's how things get established in the earth. I believe that's how truth gets established in the earth, is when we decide, I am not disconnecting from you, we're going to push through this thing together toward resolution. Yeah. And for some reason, we've just broken that all down, and we just say, damn it, this is right, and if you don't agree, you're out. Yeah. And I think we've broken, society is literally breaking down as a result. That's correct, that's correct. Because we're not, we want to be able to see people for who they are, who God, how God sees them, and I come alongside of how God sees them, and that's how I see them, and that's how I interact with them, and hopefully that comes back to me at that same level. We're relating to people as people, as persons who are created in the image of God, 
And therefore, I want to see them that way and interact with them that way. Yep. So let's go to this verse, yep. 19. Yep. So then it, the context is that everything comes from the Father of lights. There is no shadow or shifting. We exercise His will because we were brought forth by the word of truth that we might be these first fruits of that which we came from. And then that's the context for verse 19. This you know. I love that. <laughs> James like, you know this, guys. Everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. And then 20, for the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. What I hear, I read this verse probably 50 times in the last couple of weeks. And what I hear over and over again is in the discourse, even in the heat of the discussion or the conflict or the difference of opinion, the person who slows it down, the person who chooses to see, okay, I've got a reaction or I've got a response and it's good and it's going to hit them and it's finally going to make the point that I've needed them to make all along. If we slow that response down and we not only hear that person, but we also hear the father's perspective on that person and the issue. Like there's a whole lot happening in that difference of opinion, in that ideological separation. The one who slows it down and listens to both the heart of the person and the heart of God, I believe begins to establish the righteousness of God in that relationship. Right. That's correct. Uh, kind of the word I use for that is I diffuse it. In other words, in electricity, you have to have the fuse in or the breaker on. And I just kind of flip the breaker off, not to turn you off, but to turn my, I diffuse something inside of me. And I don't have this strong emotional response to you. Suddenly, I start to hear you. That's the listening part. Lots of times whenever we're in, a, in a something that's happening, like we're talking about here, is there's so much emotion in me, and probably in you, but I know it's in me. Yeah. And I start to respond from that emotion. I have to diffuse that because when I'm in that strong emotion, I'm uh, not too quick to listen. And I'm usually pretty quick to speak. That's opposite of what Paul's writing here. Right. He says, connect, hear, listen. Listen to what's being said. How many times when you're listening, are you formulating your next statement? Absolutely. Rather than actually hearing what's coming to you. And now let's continue in our relationship. It's quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Um, it's pretty important that we, speak, we are able to see each other at that level to hear each other's hearts, to connect with each other, even if there's a difference that we're, we're able to do that. It doesn't say, sit down and shut up. I don't think that's what that verse is saying. Right, it What's it say? Be slow to speak. It doesn't say don't speak. Sometimes you may, maybe shouldn't speak. Maybe the slowness sometimes is not to speak, but I don't think that's what Paul is saying here. Be quick to listen. Be slow to speak and be slow to become angry. When I've been heightened in my own emotion, like you just described, right. and a person in my relationships slowed it down and actually began to listen to me, when I realized that that person was trying to understand where I was coming from, uh -huh. I suddenly didn't feel so driven to get my point across. Right. In that moment, I suddenly realized, oh, wait a minute, this person is starting to try to understand me. Now, what goes on in the mind of that person is the possibility of, oh, if I seek to understand them, they might think that I think they're right. Yep. And so there's that lie that goes on. Has anybody ever had that? Oh, if, if I seek to understand, then automatically they think that I think they're right. Yep. I'm agreeing with them. Right. And you have to go past that. Just because you're seeking to understand does not necessarily mean you have to agree with the point. It means you're seeking to go beyond or behind 
that which they're saying, like the spirit of a thing is more important than the thing. You guys remember that? Like that is so valuable. And I have, I've learned that from people seeking the spirit behind what I'm saying. Like oftentimes when I'm in the depths of an argument with Dawn or when I'm in a disagreement with somebody, the person wise enough to see where that might be coming from. Yeah. When they begin to understand, you know what? You've had some experiences that resulted in how you feel, don't you? Like, whoa, like that person just took a second in the midst of our discourse to like really consider why I'm thinking the way I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. And in that moment, I was able to kind of drop my, having to prove my point, to have to get you to hear me. And it actually caused me to want to listen and hear their perspective as well. Like if, I feel like they sowed a seed of understanding and they reaped a harvest of understanding in me. And it began a healing process that uh, those relationships still exist to this day because people like that chose to listen or I chose to listen. Correct. It's whenever we, are, we're, we tear down the wall between us and make it a bridge. I tear down the wall, make it a bridge so that we can go back and forward. That's what keeps a relationship alive. Even though there may be some differences and maybe even some strong differences, it keeps the relationship alive. It keeps the relationship connected. But whenever we, uh, I wrote down, uh, as we're talking here, I asked Ruth, I said, what would be one thing you would say this morning? So she is a part oh, of this. Just, just, yeah. And she said, we need to be peacemakers instead of peacekeepers. Peacemakers, blessed are the peacemakers, for they are the sons of God. And so we need to be able to speak, but peacemaker, I speak the truth to you. I speak it in a certain way. I speak it in love. And that, uh, that doesn't mean that I have the right or the privilege to belittle you, to put you down, to discredit you, to discount you, or minimize you. I still see you as that important person. And as I'm... I think that what, it's, what it means is I, not that I, I need, I want to learn because of the presence of the Spirit of God in me that emboldens me to interact with you, encourages me or strengthens me to interact with you. I can uh, see your value, see your worth, and interact with you at that level and be, be slow to speak so I'm fully connected to you to see you at that level. Let me ask you a question. I didn't prepare you for this, but I just thought of it as you were sharing that. So how could you help us determine how to not see disagreement with a perspective we have as an insult to who we are? Like, how do we differentiate the ability to have someone disagree with us, and yet we still remain, like, open and in um, intimacy with that person and not feel hurt and feel like they're breaking the relationship because we're disagreeing on this. Could you help us kind of navigate that a little bit? I think it, it, it really basically, Mark, starts with understanding and knowing who I am. And as I'm interacting with you, you're not defining me. You're not I'm not allowing what, I'm, what I may be feeling from you to put me in a certain place that I have to respond to that. So, but if all I see is our difference is a barrier between us, I, I have to be able to understand where has, what, what is causing that difference and be able to see from God's perspective as much as I can, because I don't know all of the details of your life, but I understand that what's coming from you to me, it, that's a difference, might simply be um, how you're thinking, how you're feeling, how you're acting, is coming from, maybe coming from a place of hurt, may be coming from a place of frustration. It might be coming from a place of disappointment. It may be coming from a place of being angry about something. It might be coming from a place that you feel like something is unfair or it's not right. It's really wrong. And so what happens is 
if I'm not careful, I'm, I'm beginning to interact with you with everything that happened in your life. And I have to allow you to have time to sort through things as we dialogue or as they're living their life, you're living your life. I have to allow you to have time to process everything, not so you get to my place, but to where you get, not to where you get to a place where you would agree with me, but where you get to a place that Jesus is the intimate person in your so life. You and just described one of the reasons why it's slow to speak is important. Mm -hmm. So as I, let's say I'm that person and I'm telling you why I disagree or why you're wrong, your slowness to respond allows me to have to kind of sit in those things that I've just said or the things that I'm thinking about. Right. Uh, this is a question I often ask myself as I'm interacting with someone and I, I can understand that probably there's a lot of pain in their heart or whatever that they're feeling that way. And what I have to understand is, so God, how many years did you wait till Wayne got it? And not saying I'm 100% yet, and I'm not. But God was really patient with me. Would you be patient with me as I'm patient with you? Because I know God's patient with you. And he allows us space in our lives to get things figured out. We have to do the same for others. We have right. to do the same for others. Yep. Yeah. So when we, when we look at... How can I say this? I don't want to present something this morning to you that's an impossibility. And you might say to me, well, you're, you've... You're a counselor, you interact with this a lot more, so you have it together a lot more than I do. That's not true, just in case you think it is. Because when I see certain things posted, or I see certain things written, and I see certain things on the news, and I see certain things, you don't think I have an emotional upheaval in me? There's times when I do. But one thing I've learned is, okay, let's settle her down here, Wayne. Now, that's, that you and I work it out. And now, give me the strength from that to interact with you. And that's a process that we continue to go through. And so, as I interact with you, it's the same way. Because I have to be able to do that inside of me. Life isn't very fair at times. People aren't very fair at times. But guess what? God allows them in my life to refine me and to allow me, help me get to a place where I can begin to interact with you or people from a good place. And I, I am constantly being refined in my life. And God allows things to help that process. When I look at no, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. It's okay. <laughs> when I look at when I look at Washington D.C. today, I don't see too many senators, and I don't see too many representatives. You know who I see? I see Jesus and Wayne. And how's Wayne going to respond to all this? When I see you or I see my wife, or I see my children, or I see my neighbors. And there might be something going on, but it's like, Wayne, how are you going to allow God to work in your heart? Because I can't control what's done to me. I am fully in charge of how I respond to what's done to me. And whether that's in D.C. or in my house, or anywhere in between. It's important how I respond. And God is, God is at work in here, sharpening me, grinding off those things that he didn't put there in the first place. I put it there because of whatever's going on in my life. I allowed those things to come in there. And he's saying, it's time we'll deal with those. And I've used Mark to help you along the way, Wayne. Thanks, God. I appreciate that. No, I don't. <laughs> but I allow it to happen. I really like that perspective of 
people who are in our lives, especially those who rub us the wrong way, are in our lives to refine us. Yeah. Like, that's painful. And in the, I, I feel like there is this acceleration of exaggeration in our culture where, like, in the last, I would say, in the social media age, it is no longer about that. It is much more about creating division and creating sides instead of realizing that that other perspective is actually in my life to bring about the fullness of God. Yep. So instead of allowing that to take place, we can oppose it. And in the opposition, we're not just opposing that person. We're actually opposing the work of the Lord and in it, our lives. That's right. That's what I'm hearing you say. That's exactly what I'm saying. And sometimes that sharpening in me, the sparks fly. You know why? I don't like it. When you sharpen your mower blade, what happens? The sparks fly. It's because it's, it's taking off things there that shouldn't be there, and it's making that really razor sharp. That's the way it is with us. God continues to sharpen us. And the more we resist, the more the sparks will fly. And so as God continues to sharpen me, it makes me more, come more into the likeness of him. So I was thinking about how kids have temper tantrums. Anybody ever seen a kid have a temper tantrum? Yeah, I've seen it a time or two. Dexter, you just pointed at Coda? <laughs> okay. I've seen some adults have temper be an tantrums issue. too. Yeah, I've seen adults have temper tantrums too, but they look differently. And I think the current adult temper tantrum is separation. Uh-huh. I, looks... like, I don't like what you're yep. representing, and I will stay away from you because I don't like you. Right In on. fact, I will block you out of my life because I don't like you. And it looks graceful, and it looks adult-like, and it makes sense because this person's violating some boundary or whatever it is. We, we can create all kinds of justifications around it. I'll, and look, don't get me wrong. There are some people that probably need to be pushed a little bit farther out of your life if there's abuse. So please do not hear that as writing off abuse because there are certain places and certain situations that there needs to be space, okay? But in the vast majority of the separation that's happening in the world today, it is not the result of abuse. It's the result of disagreement. It's the result of choosing not to see another's heart or another's perspective. And as a result, we justify separation. We justify blocking, like you said. We justify uh, canceling the other person out. And then here's what we do. And I've, I, I, can feel the old, I can feel this temptation in my life, and I see many people do it specifically on social media, where they'll create like groups of solidarity, where you'll find like-minded people who want to write off people like you too. And we'll create, like, if we can find four or five people or four or five hundred or four or five thousand people who agree with writing you off, now we're all the more justified in why we need to separate. And honestly, has anybody ever done this? Let's be real here. When you have a disagreement and you decide to push someone out of your life, you will innately go find someone to agree with the reason why you're doing it. It, it's, it's not because you're a great person or that you're a terrible person. It's just innate. You want to feel not alone. Yep. You want to feel righteous. And if you have somebody with you, that you kind of check the box of, oh, okay, if somebody else agrees with me in writing you off or separating. I see this in church all the time. How many people have seen this? You leave a church and you find someone who doesn't like that church too. It and validates so, our opinion. We think it validates our opinion. It validates our, our opinion. It val oh, of course we're right. Look, so-and-so thinks it. Guys, I want to tell you, that's an adult temper tantrum. Yep. And it, I think uh, uh, what Mark's sharing here is so important because when we're thinking that way, that's a worldly mentality. That's not a God-given perspective. And Mark, the, I just want to share a couple of verses here as we're yeah. talking about this. 2 Corinthians 10, 2 through 6, or 3 through, 3 through 6, I guess it is. And I'm, I, I printed this out in the Passion Translation because it is so personal. 
2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 6, it says, For although we live in the natural realm, we, being Christians, we don't wage military campaign employing human weapons, using manipulation to achieve our aims. Instead, our spiritual weapons are energized with divine power to effectively dismantle the defenses behind which people hide. We can demolish every deceptive fantasy that opposes God and breaks through every arrogant attitude that is raised up in defiance of the true knowledge of God. We capture every thought and insist that it bow in obedience to the anointed one. Since we are armed with such dynamic weaponry, we stand ready to punish any trace of rebellion as soon as you choose to complete obedience. That is so powerful. And what you're saying here, Mark, is that is the way we have a tendency to do it, is a worldly way of doing it. It's not God's way of doing it. And we need to be able to make sure we destroy every stronghold in our life. We destroy every speculation. We destroy every pretense that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take every thought, every emotion, every feeling, we take it captive to the obedience of Christ. In other words, it's like I'm going down this trail and I say, I just grabbed a hold of that thought that was not in obedience to Christ. I grab a hold of that thing and destroy it. I destroy it. I don't just somehow change it. In other words, I don't just I have this pen in my pocket. If I just unscrew this pen and take it apart, I've destroyed it, haven't I? No, I haven't. I've just changed it a little bit. But if you give me a sledgehammer and I take this, out, this pen outside the front door and I use a sledgehammer in this for two or three minutes, do you think it would be destroyed? It absolutely will be. We don't just change how we think a little bit. We allow those thoughts that don't line up with the Word of God. We take it captive and make it obey Jesus Christ. It's so powerful that we understand that. And today, it's important that we understand there's a lot of things happening around us, but we're the favored ones. We are the favored ones. We can do it different. Why? Because Jesus was here. He went back with the Father, and he said, I'm not going to let you alone. I'm going to send my Holy Spirit. And the Spirit of God dwells within us, empowering my personal spirit, and gives me the ability to be the bold one, to speak truth, because I'm the favorite one. We are the favorite ones. We have to be able to stand strong in the world we live in today. And understand, we can live a different way. We can act and respond a different way. When I read those verses, I know a lot of us do this, 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 6. We can always see it as, uh, like those, that last couple words there, of 6. And we are ready to punish all disobedience whenever your obedience is complete. Like we always think about, I am ready to punish Wayne's yeah. disobedience. Mm -hmm. Like... We, we think of it externally. Like we actually use this as a weapon. Like we're going to destroy the arguments and the strongholds inside of the other person. Right. But the reality is it's actually a caution to us. Yep. This is a verse about us. Before I ever open my mouth to respond, I first take captive every thought. And for me, like I, I've said this to you guys before, but I think the taking captive of every thought is to take that thought and put it literally in front of the Lord. And I believe the Lord, one of the things I see about Jesus is like a burning fire. Like, and so a, a thought that is sourced in Jesus survives the fire of Jesus. Would you guys agree? Yeah. So if I'm going to have a thought that comes from the Lord and I send it through his fire, it's coming around the other side and I better speak it. That's the truth. That's the slow to speak. I will speak, but I'm going to speak that which is sourced in the heart of my Father because I'm that favorite one. I'm that first fruit of the Lord himself. But if I have this thought and I've taken it captive and I let the fire of the Lord kind of have its way with it and it goes up like smoke, let it go. Like let it be destroyed. 
It's better than a sledgehammer. Like, let that thing go right through the fire of the Lord. The problem is we have an allegiance to that thought because we've entertained it for a really long time. Anybody? I've got a principle. I've got a belief. I've got a thought process that I've literally built a house on it in my own heart. And now how would I, if I send that through the Lord and the Lord destroys it, I could actually be offended at the Lord. Has anybody ever been offended at the Lord for him not agreeing with you? I hate when the Lord disagrees with me. Like, how can the Lord be so wrong? He loves you, Mark. I know, but he's wrong. <laughs> Here's the problem. We never get to the point where we allow the Lord to be wrong, quote, unquote, wrong. The reality is if you spend long enough in the Lord being wrong, you realize he's not the one. <laughs> the slow to speak allows the Lord to actually give you his perspective on what you built your house on or you, whatever it is that you want, metaphor you want to use. If we are slow to speak, we take these thoughts captive and we allow the Lord to have his way with them. And I actually think we'll be people of less words, but the words that we do speak will have such authority, will have such season of love with it that people will not be able to write it off. And even if they do write it off, don't get me wrong, people's reactions do not determine the seed's harvest. This is so, in fact, I have learned some of the strongest words of love I've ever spoken have had some of the strongest reactions. Has anybody ever had this? Yep. That does not mean it didn't go in. Correct. In fact, oftentimes the strongest reactions are the ones that go in past. Let the seed do its work. Yep. It's so important. Yep. Go ahead. We got to finish up here. It's 1130-ish. Okay. Give us our last couple, like, bam. Well, it also goes in and talks about anger, being slow to anger. Yeah. And uh, we think that anger is this hateful thing that we do. No, anger is an emotion. It's from... It's from the Lord. It's from the Lord. What I do with it de determines whether it's good or bad. Anger has been given... It's an emotion given to us by the Lord. We need to be slow to anger. Don't let the sun go down upon your anger. In other words... Anger is an emotion. It's an energizer. It's a motivator that causes me to do something. I determine what, it, what I'm going to do with it. But we need to be slow to it because it, we, first of all, need to be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. But I, one I'd just like to make a statement here <clears throat> at, as we close, Mark. And this is, I wrote this down. <clears throat> Nothing is impossible. When mankind sets aside their own self-interest, selfishness, self-centeredness, and they look beyond themselves to the interest of God and others. Can you say that whole thing again? Nothing is impossible when mankind sets aside his self-interest, his selfishness, his self-centeredness, and looks beyond himself to the interest of God and to others. And when we're able to do that, allow God to deal with this thing, this heart, this attitude, this whatever, and God, we allow God to work in that. It takes away that self-centeredness. It takes away that self-interest. It takes away that um, selfishness, self-centeredness. I look beyond Wayne to your interests and to God's interests. And when I'm able to do that, when I'm able to do that, I become a healed person and I become a person that can interact with you in a healthy way. But the first thing that needs to happen, and Leslie covered it Wednesday night, we have to get this right. The Pharisees came to Jesus and they said to Jesus, come on Jesus, tell us which is the first and greatest commandment. Jesus answered them like he did everybody else. He sort of sidestepped her question. Sound of the way Jesus interacted with people a little bit. But he was Jesus. And he said, he didn't give them one of the ten. That's what they wanted. They wanted to know the Ten Commandments. And he said, love me with all your heart, soul, and mind. And then you love your neighbor as you love yourself. When this becomes right, suddenly I love Wayne. 
And because I love Wayne from this, I now love you as I love myself. And when we do that, I'm able to look at the interests of God and the interest of you. And that's when I'm willing to lay down my selfishness because I know who I am in him. Thank you. Could you pray over us? I, I titled what I sat down this morning or yesterday and started to write stuff out. This is how I titled this. Value people for who they are. When I'm able to value people for who they are, from knowing who I am, I can value you for who you are. That's when I honor you, I respect you, I want to stay in relationship with you, and I'll interact with you in a healthy way. I am so, I get really passionate when I start talking about relationships because I see the pain when there's broken relationships. And I see the joy when Jesus is at the center and relationships heal. But I see the pain when they're not good. But I also see the joy when they are good. And I know that Abba Father is in charge of this heart of mine. And I want to make sure that's in place in a right way as I relate to all of you. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much that you relate to us. You loved us so much and cared about us so much. You came to the earth. You interacted with us. You walked among us in the form of Jesus. And today you're here with us by your spirit that dwells within us, empowering us, equipping us to relate to each other in a healthy way. Give us the ability, Father, to see people the way you see them and to respond to people from our perspective that's according to your plan for our lives and how we see others, that we can interact with each other from that perspective. I pray, Father, that what was shared this morning will find fertile soil in our hearts and in the thoughts of our mind to know who we are, your favorite ones, and know that we represent truth, life, and hope to the, to the world we live in today. I bless what was shared this morning. I bless it to our understanding and to our insight. And may it bear much fruit. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Blessings to you. Have an awesome week. Thanks, Thanks for, Mark. Thanks for being with us, everybody. Hope it was helpful. Love you all.